Okay, um, thank you everyone. Can we take a seat? Um, good evening, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name's Simon Davies. I'm obviously on the Beef and Lamb Farm Council. I'm farming up at Milton. Um, but anyway, we're here to uh, uh, talk, or should say, um, Sue and Tim are going to give us a bit of a talk today on uh, feeding fodder, swedes and fodder beet to pregnant use in late pregnancy um, and all we need to know about it. So uh, Sue's actually based at Agris, Agri Research here in Palmerston North um, and Tim is from our part of the world, he's actually over down in Pu uh, at Manapuri, uh, works for Landcorp or Pun Punamu Farms or Palmu Farm, Landcorp as most of us know it. Um, so without further ado I'll, I'll let them up and they can start talking. Thank you very much for that, Simon. Can everybody hear me down the back? Great. Um, so unlike uh, Doug earlier on, I'm not going to have a problem with this thing ducking underneath, so, um, but I'll stay over this side if I can. Um, okay, so thank you very much for, um, for the pleasure of being able to be here today. It's always nice to come down to the, the bottom part of the country. I um, haven't been down here for a couple of years, so very much uh, thank Beef and Lamb for the opportunity to come and talk to you. Um, so my background, uh, I'm a scientist at, at Ag Research, also what they call a science impact leader, so um, I guess one of my passions is actually trying to get impact out of the science that we do. I think so often we get stuck in labs and we don't actually go out and talk to farmers and tell people about what we're doing uh, to be able to create impact from, from our science. Um, I, I grew up on a sheep and beef farm in the Rangitiki region of the North Island, so hill country farming. Um, we had sheep, beef and deer, so for velvet production, families still are in farming um, and still closely aligned to the farm. Um, developed a, a passion for the sheep industry from a young age. My job on the farm was rearing the orphan lambs um, and funnily enough I still do a lot of that, uh, a lot of lamb rearing systems. Um, during my PhD, I uh, got a PhD in animal science at Massey University and my focus was on fetal growth and development particularly trying to understand how we're feeding our animals in pregnancy and the impact that that's having on the developing fetuses, whether it's one, two, three or more, um, and the long-term impacts of that on the survival, growth, development and productive performance of those animals. Um, so very much interested in nutrition. I'm a physiologist by training, not a nutritionist, um, but interested in how nutrition affects um, the performance of our animals. Um, and in more recent times I've been doing work um, with early life nutrition, pregnancy and neonatal periods, and looking at things like fodder crops, um, which are an imbalanced diet, and I'll talk about that, and trying to understand how do we utilise these feeds to meet the nutrient requirements of our animals. So what I'm going to talk about today, yes we'll talk about um, fodder beet and swedes as examples, but what I'm really talking about is nutrition, how we um, need to think about meeting the nutrient requirements of our animals, understanding what that means, and thinking about our farming system and the feeds that we've got available and how we're actually going to utilise those feeds in the best way possible to get value out of the feed and to be able to meet the requirements of our animals to, um, to get good productive animals and make profit. So it's actually trying to understand those, those systems, um, not just understanding um, a component of the system, whether that's the feed or the animal. So I'm going to talk about a couple of projects today, and one of those projects I did um, with Tim Smith, um, who's going to be co-presenting uh, that project today. So I'll just let Tim um, briefly introduce himself. Yeah, I'm Tim Smith. Um, yeah, I manage a property for Lancorp Palmu in Manapuri. Uh, there's about 5,000 stock units. Um, I've been with the company um, probably coming up 20 odd years on and off. I've been out a couple of times and come back. Um, basically, Freestone is the property I manage. Uh, we, I look after the Romney Recorded Scheme there um, and also the Wapiti Breeding Scheme as well. Um, I've been involved in genetics um, for quite a, quite, a, quite a while, quite a number of years, longer than I can just about remember. Um, but I've also had quite an interest in survivability of stock, um, also um, in yeah, 
lamb survival in particular, especially in large scale properties. I was managing Maro Station for about 10 bit years and we were getting up 3,500 triplet bearing ewes. And this session isn't just about triplets, it's about ewe nutrition full stop because um, lamb survival is going to be a big thing for all of us going forward. So um, yeah, that's my basic background. Thanks Tim. Okay, before I start, I just want to um, make a few acknowledgements. Um, in addition to uh, acknowledging Beef and Lamb for their support to come here today, I'd also like to um, acknowledge a couple of my fellow um, colleagues at Ag Research, uh, Kirsty Hammond and David Pacheco, who have done um, a number of, uh, of ruminant nutritionists and have been involved in the projects that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, also my team, the Animal Nutrition and Physiology team, um, and our farm staff at our, one of our research farms, Aurangi Farm, and also for Tim um, and his uh, staff at, at Freestone for being involved in, in the project work, but also enabling us to come in and work with him on farm and to, to be so open and honest about the farming systems that he's got and um, his, his gains and his challenges as well. So it's about learning together and, and co-developing um, that knowledge together. So um, very much thank Tim for that. Um, and we've had funding from Ag Research, uh, Beef and Lamb, and also from Landcorp that's supported some of this work. So, fodder beet. Why fodder beet? So there's been recent, um, uh, what they call a revolution associated with fodder beet. Um, it's come about uh, as an alternative feed option, particularly in the winter periods, um, so that um, it's got high dry matter yield, um, it's got a low cost per unit of feed, it's also a very high energy feed, um, and it has been reported to be able to improve cattle weight gains um, compared to pasture. Uh, and it has been utilised in systems to be able to maintain um, a feed source over winter to be able to rest the, rest the pasture and to ensure that we've got pasture available in spring. Um, also been used to increase stocking rates uh, on farm um, and to be able to deal with some of those feed shortages in areas where pasture just doesn't grow during the winter time. So that, that's really good. Um, although um, some, there's some limitations, we think, in, in terms of this feed. Um, in the recent study that AgriSearch did uh, with funding from Beef and Lamb and Agmard, uh, we looked at the growth rate of lambs on fodder beet. Now, if we look at the um, composition and the digestibility of the feed, based on feed modelling, we should have been able to get about 100 to 120 grams a day out of those lambs um, during that winter period. After, um, long story short, after running that trial, what we saw is the lambs actually grew about 70 grams per day. So much lower than what we would predict based on the, the feed quality. So the question becomes, are there nutrients other than the ME, because we know there's plenty of ME there, there are other nutrients that are limiting. Um, we know that fodder crops are low in protein. Um, and we also know that not just lambs, but pregnant animals have very high demands for protein. And so these fodder crops, although they do have high ME, and the leaves have high protein, the bulbs have low protein. And so overall, they actually are an imbalanced diet. Now this becomes important when we think about the nutrition um, of a pregnant ewe. So I'm not going to talk about lamb growth for the rest of the presentation. I'm going to talk about um, the requirements of pregnant ewes. So what this slide shows here is we've got the number of weeks preterm, and I just want you to focus on this period here. This is the last six weeks of gestation um, for a ewe. And this is what the fetal growth curve looks like. So there's rapid fetal growth in that last six weeks of pregnancy, and the lamb is actually putting on 75% of its body weight in that last six weeks. So the feed requirements of the animal are very, very high during that time. So it, during that time, it's not a time to actually give those animals low quality feed. If we look at the feed requirements in sheep, um, depending on how many lambs they're carrying, this is essentially what it looks like. Uh, so this is gestation along here, and this is the kilos of dry matter per day that these animals require. Up to around about 80 to 90 days gestation, the feed requirements are about the same. But after that, the feed requirements, are, they, they increase for a single, but they're a lot higher for a twin bearing ewe and even higher again for a triplet bearing ewe. Um, so if we look at that on a percentage basis, the feed requirements for a triplet bearing ewe are 50% greater um, and 20% greater in a twin compared to singles. So it's really important that you actually understand how many lambs are on board you use and therefore how you need to feed them. 
The other point I want to make is understand um, the composition of your feed. So dry matter is what I'm trying to illustrate here. So this is just some diets um, from a study that we're doing at the moment actually with triplet bearing ewes. Uh, and we're looking at uh, fodder beet and the impacts in um, feeding fodder beet in mid to late gestation and triplet bearing ewes. What we have here is our control diet. This is just a lucerne chaff with a bit of grain. To meet the requirements of a triplet bearing ewe at 100 days, 110 days of gestation, they need two kilos of dry matter per day at that stage. That's about 2.3 2 kilos of this mix of um, chopped lucerne and a bit of grain. When we're feeding fodder beet, that's 9.3 kilos of fodder beet plus another kilo of lucerne with a bit of grain <laughs> added um, to be able to meet the requirements of a ewe at 110 days of pregnancy. If we then fast forward to the end of pregnancy, when those nutrients requirements go up, and I'm just using triplets as a model here, um, this diet here, the ewe has to be able to eat 3.2 kilos of fresh weight of this, this particular feed here. With fodder beet, these girls are going to have to eat 14.5 kilos of fodder beet and an additional 1.5 kilos of the lucerne mix to be able to meet their requirement. I tell you, it's going to be very interesting to see whether these girls can do it or not. So, our questions. Should fodder crops be fed to pregnant animals? Is it a feed with adequate nutrition? What supplements do we put, put beside it if it's not a, if, um, a nutritionally balanced diet? And more importantly, before we actually think about the above, what is actually the impact on the dam and the offspring? So we need to figure out what's the impact and then say, well, do we need to do something about it? So I'm going to talk about two studies. The first one was where we were comparing uh, twin bearing ewes grazed on either fodder beet with hay available to be able to meet their, their fibre requirements com and comparing that to a pasture um, white clover mix um, during mid to late gestation. So this was a research trial um, and what we were aiming for is to look at the, the potential for unintended consequences on the ewes and the offspring. In the second trial was actually um, created out of the results of this one which was looking at uh, body condition score loss in ewes on a, a swede crop um, on Tim's farm and we'll come to that um, shortly. So uh, this study was done in 2016 on our Aurangi research farm and the predicted outcome that we had from this, from this study, what we thought would happen is that because the fodder beet is a high energy feed we thought that the ewes should have improved weight gain and, and condition compared to the ewes that are on pasture, so the ewes should do, it, do okay. But because fodder beet is a low protein diet and fetal, uh, fetal growth requires a high level of protein, we predicted that lamb birth weight would be lower and survival would be lower. So we wanted to know the impact on animal performance and try and understand why. So we had 200 twin bearing ewes they were randomly assigned to either a fodder beet or a rye, rye grass um, diet and there was three groups on each diet so there was replication um, in the study. Um, we followed good practice transition onto fodder beet and I'm not going to go through the, the details but they are available, um, was on and off the crop over an extended period of time, not a, um, a crash, crash course onto, onto fodder beet. Uh, we did have standard animal health treatments that included iodine, and I'm going to come back to iodine, but we um, vaccinated these ewes because clostridial diseases can be an issue, so you need to make sure you vaccinate your ewes. Um, and after lambing, the, both groups were fed on pasture right through to weaning. Um, we did offer fodder beet in the paddock um, at lambing time in our fodder beet group, and um, the reason for that is we had aimed to take those ewes off fodder beet prior to lambing, but unfortunately the predicted lambing date from our scanning was a little bit out and the ewes started to lamb on fodder beet so we transitioned them off and we kept the fodder beet in the pasture just to enable them to, to come off. It um, wasn't in intended but it actually enabled us to learn quite a bit more about what are some of the, the things that can happen if you don't get it right. Um, so uh, the, we also measured ewe carcass um, traits at late in gestation, so a week off lambing, we sacrificed a few ewes and, and had a look inside to see what was going on, and then we monitored the ewes and lambs through to weaning. So this is essentially um, a picture, these, these girls were pushed into the corner, um, show where we had the, um, we moved these around the hay feeders, so there was ad lib hay available, um, and we uh, strip grazed the fodder beet with a break every two days. Um, and 
The other girls were on, on ryegrass, and this is just feeding the fodder beet bulbs in, on the ryegrass paddock, so they were just chucked over the fence and the ewes happily ate them um, during that transition period off the, off the beet crop. So we had a ravage cultivar, grew 30 tonnes dry matter per hectare, um, and this was the estimated feed disappearance here. In a typical grazing study, as usual, you can't measure intake, you can predict what it is based on feed disappearance, that's what the numbers looked like. Um, for our ryegrass, we had 2,800 kilos of dry matter allowance um, with a residual of, of 1,200. Um, fresh break every two days. There was no back fencing, so they could go back and freely graze the bulbs or, or the pasture behind them. And both groups had free access to ryegrass, um, hay and racks. So just in terms of composition, um, got the full date details here, but what I just wanted to sort of highlight in here is the crude protein. Um, composition of the, the fodder beet, so this is the bulb and the, the leaf bulb and, or the fodder beet plus the hay, um, so different combinations of our, our supplements compared to the ryegrass. What this is showing is that the crude protein content of the fodder beet, um, both the bulb and the, um, and the, the leaves, uh, were below the requirements of a twin bearing ewe. Um, so the requirements of a twin bearing ewe can be between 14 and 18 um, percent based on previous science studies. Um, unlike the pasture where we had um, good levels of protein in that pasture. Um, and fibre content was also lower um, the rec than the recommended requirements but that was addressed by giving them plenty of hay. And these fodder beet girls, they ate a lot of hay. So this is just a picture of the, um, of the beet uh, and we took regular samples to be able to look at the composition um, of those diets. So down to what did we find? So what this graph here shows you is you live weight. Um, each little dot on here is an animal. Uh, the fodder beet girls are in red, the ryegrass girls are in blue. And along this axis here is the days post conception. So this is um, they transitioned onto the crop about 70 to 80 days of gestation. This is lambing here, where they, they had come off the crop by that stage and then they were on pasture all the way through here. This is docking and this is weaning. So what we saw here is that um, the ewe live weight, as you would expect in a, a um, twin bearing ewe, continued to increase in both groups, but at a greater rate in our um, ryegrass fed ewes than our fodder beet fed ewes. In the same way, the inverse of this, what ends up happening, or what ended up happening, um, same, same things on the axis here, except this is body condition score. The ryegrass fed ewes, you always have, ewes tend to lose um, body condition in late pregnancy anyway, but what we saw in the fodder beet fed ewes is they mobilised a lot of reserves um, and lost a lot of body condition. Um, and I'll show you a little bit later um, that it wasn't just fat that was lost, it was muscle as well. Ooh, I have to go back and check the paper. I think it was 11 or 12 percent. I have to go back and check, but I think it was at about that level. Um, but don't quote me on that. It depends what you're putting alongside it. It's the total diet that you need to be looking at, not just just a single component. So it's it's really hard to say what you should be, should be targeting. Um, whoops. So what we're seeing here is this drop in body condition in these fodder beet fed ewes, um, and then they slowly recover up to, up to weaning. When we look inside the ewes and look at the carcass composition of these animals, uh, so there was 10 in each group that were, um, that were sacrificed about a week prior to lambing. Um, and what we see here, this is carcass, fat, C and GR, so this is the same measurements that you would get done on your lambs at, at the works. Um, it was a, a trend, not, didn't quite reach significance, but what you can see from the numbers here is that these fodder beet girls um, had about half the amount of um, back fat as the ones that were grazing ryegrass. So they were mobilising fat um, to be able to meet the demands of fetal growth. They were also mobilising muscle. Okay, so the eye muscle area was, um, was lower in these girls. So with, as a result of feeding on this crop, they were mobilising both muscle and fat. So this is indicative of underfeeding, quite classical underfeed view. 
Um, we don't know whether the underfeeding was due to the fact that they might not have been able to consume enough. So could they actually physically harvest enough to be able to meet their requirements? Was it due to protein restriction? Was it because of imbalance between energy and protein? We actually don't know. So we've got some further research going on to try and unpick that by putting protein back into the diet and feeding them a balanced protein diet with other supplements to be able to see the impact on performance. And we're using triplets this time to, to study that. Um, and maybe this time next year I'll have some more answers for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about carcass fat um, is that there was, and even eye muscle area, fat up here, there was huge variation between the animals. So not every animal lost weight. Some animals actually gained weight. But on average, there was more that lost weight on the fodder beet diet. But as you can see, even on the ryegrass diet, there was some ewes that actually had very little fat. But there was more variation in these, these fodder beet fed ewes. A little bit less variation in the eye muscle, but as you can see, that on average, they were lower. Oops, sorry. Now, when we look at blood mineral concentrations, we know that um, phosphorus can be can be limiting. In these animals, um, we took blood samples at 100 days of pregnancy. There were quite a number of animals that, that were below the recommended levels of, of phosphorus. Um, but we didn't supplement because it's actually quite difficult to do that um, in, in a grazing situation. Um, when we measured them at day 135, there was only really one animal that was below, and it was the same in the ryegrass. So it seems to be not as much of an issue as it may be in, in um, cattle. Uh, with phosphorus, but in terms of iodine, just about all the animals were below the recommended levels of iodine at 100 days gestation. So these girls got flexidine, and then by um, 135 days of pregnancy, they were all at adequate levels, so um, that iodine wasn't limiting. So then we move on to the lambs. I've talked about the ewes. So what we've got here is the, per the percentage of total scanned lambs, so 100% here means 100% survival. So number of lambs that are on board, they've all survived. What we see here, this is the number that were born alive. So there was really no difference between the number of um, lambs scanned and the number born alive between the two groups. There was a few losses, but that was in, um, in both groups. Um, the big losses came after three days and then in the subsequent two to three weeks. And in a nutshell, basically, what happened is that on the fodder beet um, fed group, there was 34% mortality compared to 15% mortality in the ryegrass. So quite a heavy hit. Um, and those deaths were in that first three weeks. Now, I would like to add to that we didn't let all those lambs die. They didn't actually die in the paddock. Some of them, some of them weren't very viable, and they did. But the ones that um, mum either didn't want them, so... Doug was talking about the merinos going, oh, I've got rid of my parasite, I've been underfed, I'm just going to walk away. These girls did the same thing, they disowned their lambs, or they didn't have enough milk um, to be able to feed their lambs, and the labs, lambs were lagging behind, so ethically we didn't want to let them die in the paddock, so we picked them up and we artificially reared them, and they grew just fine. But they, if they were in a commercial situation, they wouldn't have survived. So if we look here um, at the, the live weights of the lambs, the birth weight was also lower, in those lambs from the fodder beet fed ewes um, compared to the, the ryegrass ewes. They were also lower at docking um, and they had lower live weight at weaning. So they grew slower. So the conclusions from this, yes, fodder beets are a high yielding forage option, uh, but compared to ryegrass, ewes that are um, grazing fodder beet from mid to late pregnancy seem to not be able to meet their nutrient requirements um, uh, of fibre and crude protein. They had high muscle and fat mobilisation, um, which suggests that uh, the energy and protein requirements, maybe the energy requirements were being met, but their protein requirements were not, or maybe their intake levels were not sufficient. Uh, there were negative effects on lamb survival and pre-weaning growth, um, and the low lamb live weight suggests that we did have um, restricted nutrient supply from mum, so mum just wasn't able to meet their, their requirements. These ewes were iodine deficient, and so we did have to supplement with that. So as I said earlier, we've got some ongoing um, work happening at the moment to try and identify supplementation strategies to inform um, feed management options. So in terms of a, a take-home message, um, we would suggest avoid feeding fodder beet, fodder beet as your sole feed source. Always um, be putting some supplements, high-protein and fibre supplements, alongside um, fodder beet. 
Um, you also need to think about balancing the per head performance with individual performance. So investing in your pregnant animals is an investment in your future because you actually want to be able to generate replacements and you want good land. So you need to be able to feed your pregnant ewes to realise that. Potentially feed these crops earlier in gestation. I think a lot of the effects that we saw is because these ewes were on these crops too long. And I'll come back to that when we talk about the Swedes in terms of the, the timing. Um, but we're yet to actually identify what's the optimal time to have these ewes on these crops and does that differ depending on whether they've got one, two or three lambs on board because their feed requirements are quite different. Um, we need to make sure that we're feeding a balanced diet later in pregnancy because those requirements are very high um, and we need to meet those, those nutritional requirements of the mum. So you need to know how many lambs they've got on board to be able to do that. Um, and particularly for if you've got lots of higher order multiples, consider feeding these crops to other um, classes of livestock until we've figured out how to optimise um, the use of some of these crops. So the second um, project that I want to talk about was um, looking at, at ewes that were grazed on um, swedes, well turnips and swedes, um, in a commercial setting on, on Tim's farm. With that body condition score loss that we saw in the, the fodder beet um, fed animals, we wanted to see, did we see similar relationship between loss in body condition and poor lamb survival in a swede crop? Now we unfortunately didn't have the opportunity to compare swedes with ryegrass or swedes with something else. We just went into the standard commercial flock and we said, right, depending on the age of the ewe and how many lambs on board she got, what does that profile of loss of body condition look like when they're grazed on a swede crop? And what are the implications of those changes for lamb survival? So that's what this study was about. So as I said, it was looking at relation, relating body condition score to survival through to tailing um, in ewes that were on these um, swede crops um, from scanning through to almost set stocking, so 120 days gestation. So we predicted that because Swedes are also um, low protein, uh, that may be what we would see as a reduction in new body condition score, like what we saw on the photobeat, as a reflection of the ewe needing to mobilise those reserves to be able to meet those nutritional demands. And that this change in body condition, body condition score loss, would lead to poor lamb survival. So um, this study was done last year, last lambing season on Tim's farm. There were 755 um, ewes. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Tim and he can tell you about um, how he had his farm set up and how he managed the crops. And then I'm going to flick back and talk about the results. Thanks, Sue. Should be able to read this off the screen. Right. Um, so we just took our um, recorded use last year, and this is the breakdown of the scanning. It was 50% twins, 35% triplets, 10% singles, 4.5% quads. Um, I, I don't look at, look at that and see that as a, a major problem. I just see there's a lot of potential there that I've got to learn how to actually uh, make the most of. Oops, I'll go back the other way. Um, and part of that is actually when I've got... An, um, that number of lambs on board is actually learning how to actually manage these to maximise the survival out of these animals. So in our normal policy is to um, put the ewes on um, crop in June. And I'd like to start off with uh, turnips in early pregnancy. So with H, because we use quite a, well, rest of the year they'll be on HT Swedes. HTs are quite hard on the teeth. So just to try and maximise um, the wet or minimise the wear on the ewes teeth. Um, I, I'll start them off for, up from when they go on the crop until scanning, generally on turnip, and then um, just prior to or around scanning, we'll go on for, for about a month on the HT Swedes. Um, and on, we start off early in pregnancy um, just adding ad lib ryegrass and white clover, and then later on in pregnancy, uh, just pretty much ad lib lucerne. We've got about a, a stand of 40, 40 hectares of lucerne, which is basically cut and carry, It's because uh, we can dry out. Um, it's sort of one of our risk management strategies. Um, if we can graze it, we'll graze it if we have to, but otherwise it's there in case things dry out for the summer like they did this year. Um, but generally from set stocking, yeah, the ewes are all managed on pasture from set stocking to weaning. The feed allowances, um, 
I use a, um, a U feed requirement tool. Um, basically, it's developed by um, a man in ag research now. Um, and it's designed to equate the used body condition with projected scanning results. And based on a 78 kg live weight, um, and that's pretty much those figures there are what we put into this system right at the start. Um, and that predicts my average kgs of dry matter you requires at the start of the pregnancy at 1.3. And then once we get to uh, scanning, you can split that program into singles, twins, triplets, and it'll tell us roughly what we need to feed those ewes from there on in. So when I get to scanning, all the ewes get split up into their group. So the triplets, quads will go one way, twin singles will go the other way. Right, when they go on to crop, um, we always transition onto our crops. Because um, I, like, I don't like doing cold turkey on things. And really it's to get the gut well, basically what I want to do is when we condition score all these ewes at the start, I don't want to be losing body condition score of my ewes through the winter. So to me, I want to have all my ewes, or as many of my ewes as possible in a three or better body condition score prior to the winter starting. And the idea of, um, with the feed budgeting or the program I've got there is to actually maintain those ewes the best I can through to when they're set stocked. So when we go on to crops, it's about... Um, yeah, yeah. we do this transition thing. A lot of people think it's hard work, but it's actually not too bad. Um, we always put them on with the full guts of grass um, when they go on. So before we start, they just we fill them up on grass, and then we put them on to the crops for um, maximum probably eight hours a day. Then we run them back off onto grass um, at nights, and we'll do that for about two weeks. Um, and generally, by the end of that two weeks period, the ewes are actually telling you when they want to stay on and off. So... It's about not upsetting that, that gut and that transition from going from grass onto yeah, a very watery diet of turnips. So, um, it's, yeah, it's easy, it's a good job for the young shepherds and it's also a good job for the young pups at that time of the year because there's generally not a lot of other things for them to chase then. Um, I like the four day crops breaks um, with the feed budgeting and we'll get onto the allocation in, in a minute. Four day crops, it's pretty easy to work out whether your calculations that you've given the ewes is actually working out with what you're actually seeing in the paddocks. And I think it's real, you, to, get your, to, to manage body condition score in ewes, you really got to keep an eye on the ewes and say, and look and see what, what you've written on paper and what your eye's telling you in the paddocks actually making sense. It's very easy to get it wrong. Um, in crop allocations, when I go to set things up, um, I actually measure every paddock. So I get a half metre circle out and I go around and take about eight samples out of e each paddock and work out the square meterage rate. So how, how many people actually do that here? That's good. Um, because to work out, for me, to work out the um, feed requirements for those ewes, I need to be able to work out each paddock to a square meterage rate so I know how many square meter, metres per hectare I have to give those ewes in that particular paddock. And I think that's the key part to getting your measurements right. Um, and then you can work out your wastage on top of that. And I've got, a, I've got an Excel spreadsheet that I've set up that works out all this out for me, works out the um, wastage, and they've got another little tool there that'll actually tell me exactly how many square metres per day or per four day break those animals need. And as a sideline, is anyone interested in a tool like that? If Beef and Lamb were to develop it? Because my Excel skills aren't good enough. But I think you've got to, if you do the maths, do the maths and, and try and get it as close as you can. You won't just get this 100% perfect. But if you get that right and then you, then you monitor the quality of the supplements that you bring in, you can do a reasonably good job. I'm not saying you can do it perfectly, but you, you can do a pretty good job. And, and the other beauty thing about four day breaks is it actually is a lot less work through the winter if you, you can, when you've got multiple mobs on crops, it's a lot easier to actually manage the workload on the farm. Now when we come to scanning, um, news have all been pregnancy scans, identified litter size, fetal age, 
Um, yeah, I don't know why people bother scanning and not look for singles, twins, triplets and everything because once you've got that out, you can actually start making changes. Fetal ageing, if you want to go to um, that expense, I think it's well worthwhile. It's a great tool, especially when you're trying to prioritise the workload at lambing time. You can put them into 10-day groups and prioritise where you have to be on the farm. It's just another labour-saving thing. Um, we're doing a lot of body condition scoring, mating, pregnancy scanning and pre-lambing. Um, and it's actually good to actually... I keep tabs on this because all our users have got EID tags in their ears and we can actually monitor and just see what's actually happening through the year with them. And I, I like it as a tool. Body condition score is probably another way of actually monitoring whether you've actually got your feed budgeting going right if you're doing it regularly. Um, and then all the live... The, the lamb survival data is um, it's all through DNA parentage, which is part of practice we have to do in the recorded scheme anyway. So the results, Sue. Okay, so on to the results. So what I've got here, um, this graph shows uh, predicted lamb survival um, and the difference in body condition score, um, whether it's a gain, so this is zero, and a gain in body condition score this way, or a loss goes this way. Now this data here is based on actual lambing um, percentage data, and then using that um, relative to the changing condition that we saw in those ewes, and then being able to predict what our survivability would be on those lambs. Um, so what we saw here, this is the three to four year old ewes. We had no two year old um, ones in this, in this data set so, um, from what I'm showing here. So in the three to four year old ewes, what I want you to focus on is this green bar in here. When we get out down here and up here, there's too few animals to actually rely on the data. But if you look at the green line, um, that's what I want you to look at. So here, this is single and twin bearing ewes at, at the top here. In the middle here is triplet bearing ewes. And this is quads, and there was a couple of quintuplets in there as well. Um, what we see is with a one body condition score loss, so going from plus um, half a condition score through to minus half a condition score, if we look at the losses um, or the change in survival for, with that one body condition score loss, what we see is an 8% um, reduction in lamb survival in singles and twins. So it seems to be about the same. So if a single and a twin bearing ewe lose one condition score, they're losing another 8% of their lambs. For triplets, it's even more. It's 15%. And for quads, it's about 20% reduction. So what that's showing is that if you, your ewes are losing condition, you're losing the ability to capture that value from those lambs that are on board because those lambs will be dying. The greater proportion of those lambs die. Um, so it just highlights the importance of body condition score. Over here, this is showing ewes that are five plus years old. And essentially, the curves look about the same, but if you look at where they, they intersect with this axis, um, the impact on these older ewes is greater. Okay? Um, so the percentage losses are even greater. So those ewes, they have ability to get in lambs, and some of them can actually manage triplets quite well and, and higher order multiples quite well. Um, but they're less effective overall at being able to take those lambs through to weaning. Um, so they're metabolically more fragile, and we need to look after those ewes even better. So in terms of key findings, 10% um, of singles, 12% um, twins, 34% triplets, and 47% of the quads lost body condition score prior to scanning during that time frame that Tim, Tim described. So although, despite the best efforts of putting them on, on a crop and giving them really good quality supplement and trying to make sure that we're giving them good feed allowances, we still had a high number of ewes that lost condition, especially those higher order multiples in here. Um, so that's what happened pre-scanning. These were the numbers post-scanning, so it got worse. And these are the, the survivability of those lambs through to, through to tailing. Um, so as expected... Um, survival of the, the higher order multiples goes down. So loss in condition from pregnancy scanning to about 120 days can impact um, negatively on the survivability of those lambs. It gets worse when you've got three or more lambs on board, 
and worse still when those ewes are older. So um, we believe there's a potential contribution of protein intake um, or a balance between energy and protein that, that's indicated from this data. We actually don't know exactly what's driving this, but it does highlight the need for more research to try and understand what those specific feed requirements over and above just overall dry matter is for these, these pregnant ewes and how we can more effectively use these crops. I'm not saying we shouldn't be using them, we just need to recognise the potential limitations of them and think about how we can more effectively use them. Um, I would like to say that there were very few ewes that lost a lot of condition, but there were some, um, but most of those ewes were ones that were carrying four or more lambs. And that's likely due to the, the careful attention to ewe feeding that Tim does on his farm and the level of feed budgeting um, and provision of good quality supplements. He talked about um, moving from a grass baleage through to a lucerne baleage, getting better quality supplementary feed going in. Um, and he made the point, and I want to reiterate the point, if you're feeding supplements, don't assume all baleage is the same, because in terms of quality, it's often not, and usually the quality is a lot less than what you think it is, and don't believe the contractor when they tell you what it is. Ask them for a copy of the composition results. Um, so essentially, overall, there's still room for some improvement here. Um, we also noted in this particular study um, a higher than expected losses in our singles. Now, we don't actually know what's driving that, but I was quite surprised to see 15% losses in singles. I thought it should have been lower than that. We don't know what's driving that one. So, careful dietary transitions critical. Um, good quality feed is really important, making use of good quality supplements. Um, making sure that you're treating with iodine to avoid def deficiencies and consider, as Tim was indicating, managing ewes with one, two or three lambs on board differently. So identify them at scanning and think about how you might manage their feeding differently. Don't just run them all together, assuming that their feed requirements are the same because they're not. Um, just reiterating the point of um, the value of body condition scoring, it is a really valuable tool for um, nutritional management. Um, it doesn't just tell you which ewes are the bottom end ewes in your flock that um, if you're short on feed, you might want to, to sell those and to be able to free up feed for the rest of your ewes, or you might want to preferentially feed them. But also, as Tim was saying, it actually um, enables you to see whether your feeding management is working properly or not. So it's a good monitoring tool. Um, and I love the quote that Tim told me one day, that wool hides a lot of sins. So don't rely on eyeball analysis if your ewes have got wool on their back because you will quite possibly get it wrong. Um, and pregnancy scanning is also that valuable tool that we've been talking about. Um, it enables you to be able to work out how you need to feed those ewes to meet their requirements. Um, and consider that fetal ageing to match the feed requirements for those animals, but also to help on a practical basis day to day, as Tim was indicating, at, at lambing time. It's a busy time of year. If you can try and make that job easier by knowing who's going to be lambing first and which ones you need to be monitoring, that actually makes the job a little bit easier. And make a feed budget and monitor the performance of that feed budget. Um, <coughs> remember the requirements of the, uh, based on the size of the U. So a bigger ewe has higher requirements than a smaller ewe and the number of lambs that she's got on board. Um, and make sure that you plan ahead and monitor. So thinking about feed requirements in spring at lambing time is, is too late. We need to be thinking about that much earlier. Um, and as I said earlier, we need to be doing some more research to, to work out how to best utilise these fodder crops as a winter feed option um, for our pregnant ewes. Um, and my final comment is to consider um, that meeting the nutrient requirements of the use is an investment, not a cost. Thank you. I think we've just all got to remember that uh, just because we've done something for the last two or three years and it seems to be working isn't necessarily always the right option. And I think what this has shown to me is I thought I was doing quite a good job but it's actually thrown up a whole lot of questions that, and, and things that say that actually I could be probably doing quite a lot better in some areas. So I think we've got to be prepared to actually um, go outside the square and just think, especially managing multiple bearing ewes and ha when and how we do things, actually change and start looking at things as actually when we take them off crops, do we perhaps try and scan a little bit earlier and actually make changes then and try and do something with low body condition score use to actually get a better overall effect at the end. But the uh, ultimate uh, lambing percentage at the end of this, I was 4% back on the year before. Still a good, we still had a good result, but there's still um, there's probably um, a few percent of the singles we could have picked up, and there's probably another 
five to six percent in the twins alone that we could have picked up again. So it's all about little incremental change. All right, no, thank you very much, both of you. Um, I think, Tim, you should knock yourself around too much. You're doing a much better job at it than me. Um, so obviously we've got time for a couple of three questions, um, and then we're off to afternoon tea. But question over here. Tim, you uh, kept the ewes that were multiples on after scanning, obviously for this test. How long, you know, we take ours out and when we scan, the singles and lates go on the fodder beat or Swedes. Yeah, we took them through to six weeks prior. So you, you took them through to six weeks Six prior. weeks, yeah. 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 Because I've sort of always felt that as long as we were feeding enough um, Swedes and supplements, we were doing okay. Um, but this would suggest that, no, I'm not doing okay. Do you use harnesses? No. Any you had your scanner, though, take them out. My, 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 my scanner can put them down to five-day groups for me. Oh, thanks. Um, for Sue, uh, fodder beat, use on fodder beat, do you not think that perhaps it's better off to take them off the fodder beat five weeks prior to lambing and, and to increase their protein that way rather than keeping them right up? I'm pretty sure there has been some research done on that, uh, that you take your, your sheep off fodder beat prior to you know that five-week period, four-week period. Yeah, I think ultimately um, that's what you would be wanting to try and do. So, but what we've been hearing um, out there in industry is that some people are leaving them on up until a week or two weeks prior to lambing. So that's what we were trying to replicate in that first study to see what the implications of that were going to be. Unfortunately, in our case, the scanner did get the dates wrong and um, some of those ewes lambed early. So it wasn't actually that one to two weeks. For some of the ewes it was, most of them it was that one to two weeks prior to lambing that they came off the crop. Um, but based on what we saw and from Tim's results on the, on the Swedes, I think... For triplets, I would be thinking about um, not putting them on crops after scanning uh, because their requirements are going up between that 80 to 100 days. Um, and then for your, for your singles and twins, um, no later than about 110 days. So um, getting them off, off earlier. But even then, um, during that period, looking at the Swede data with good quality lucerne baleage alongside them, which we would have thought should have been able to meet, meet the requirements of those <coughs> ewes, we still have body condition score loss and, and poor survival in some of those, those animals. So um, I think we don't know the optimum period of time. Um, that's why I say I think there needs to be some more work done um, on that. And, and like that time of the year is a real stress point on most sheep farms because the grass really hasn't started kicking into it and everybody wants to hold everything as long as they can. And it's a real compromise between um, yeah, letting things go and then running yourself into a problem or yeah, holding back and, and trying to make the most of it. So perhaps there's, there's some lessons there we need to learn. Is, is there something else in the system we can do to actually ease the pressure in that spring? Because that, to me, and that's always the pressure point of the whole year. You can make or break your whole year there. The, the other issue that I have is your, your ryegrass group were, were offered quite a bit of grass and you were leaving a 1,200 residual well, show me a farmer in this room that leaving a 1,200 residual. Absolutely. Highlights the importance of feeding. In that study, what we wanted to do is make sure that they weren't restricted. So that's what we'd be, be recommending for, um, for your higher order multiples. Um, we didn't want to be compromising the results by, by restricting the, the ryegrass intake. So um, that's why we, we kept on that. This wasn't, that wasn't set up as a commercial study. I agree with you. A lot of farmers don't feed to that level. Um, and I would be challenging them as to whether they should be. In, in my operation, at 1,200 residual, that's the minimum, that's the minimum we go to. Right, I'll operate gener generally around um, 15 to 1,800 all the time. When I set stock, I'll be up around 2,500 per, per, per triplet bearing ewes. But I do not like my ewes grazing below 1,200. I like a lot, I'm more along grass, grass grows grass. You get over 1,500. 1900 you'll grow 30 percent more grass why wouldn't you um i got a question for tim you're obviously doing a blooming good job um but just wondering why you go from leafy turnip which i'd consider an easier feed onto 
uh, Swedes is a harder feed, why not go the other way round as the demands come on to the U? It's too hard to carry turnips through that long. The turnips go off, they'll start going soft and, and just go to mush before the winter, so I'm obliged to actually take them off. If I could, if I, could I would. And, and they were leafy turnips, not bulb turnips? They're a leafy HT turnip, yeah. How much substitution was the, you made the comment, um, so um, excuse me, can we just wait for the mic, otherwise it's getting on my hand here as well, yeah. Okay, I admire your um, option of trying to uh, reduce the work during the uh, winter time with your four day breaks. I would like to see a trial, because the leaf possesses most of the protein, I would like, I personally give daily breaks to my ewes, and I find it's a lot healthier for them and a lot better, and therefore you can regulate the feed even closer than a four-day. The four-day shift, I should imagine you'll use it all the top the first day and then go without after that. So it's about, it's about regulating it, and in, in Southland, we have had a hell of a winter with mud. Beginning of June, July was just diabolical. I wasn't here, I was out of the country, but, I've, I, can <laughs> <laughs> but I can see what was left behind. So therefore, you talk about daily intakes, it depends entirely on the weather and, the, and the, what you leave behind and there's no set rules. I've seen ewes go through double acres of Swedes in no time because it's been a wet fortnight. So there's no real figures on it. I don't know what you think. I'd like to see a trial on the daily compared with the four day. Um, I have a query about the uh, substitution effect of what you were feeding with the fodder beet and the hay and the swedes and the loose in baleage. Um, did you do any, and you said you weren't, because I, I said, I might be wrong here, but it seems to me is that um, the animals, the ewes on the fodder beet, you said they ate a hell of a lot of hay, and I su suggest there was a fair bit of substitution going on, hence the body condition score losses. Did you find that might be the same with the loose in baleage? Just, just explain what you mean by substitution a little bit more. Well, what I'm saying is that in the, in this, in the fodder beet trial, they, um, they ate a lot of, uh, of hay. And I suggest one of the reasons for the um, body condition losses was the fact that they were eating hay, which doesn't have the same MEs, obviously, as the fodder beet. And I'm wondering if that, the same effect was happening with the... Um, the lucerne baleage and the, um, the Swedes. So they're actually, unless you actually monitor that, you don't actually know what their intakes are, do you? No, it's very hard to actually monitor that actual mm -hmm. supplement intake. So just to add a comment to that, um, yes, you're absolutely right. There could well be substitution going on. Um, in a grazing situation, we actually don't know what's going on. Um, and that was one of our questions that came out of that initial study is, is it they can't physically consume enough? Are they substituting? Is it, is it an um, energy protein imbalance? Is it protein <coughs> deficiency? We could speculate on a lot of different things. We think it's probably protein deficiency. Um, what's the driver? We're not 100% not sure, but what I can say is in the trial we're doing at the moment um, with triplet bearing ewes, uh, we've got 56 of them indoors in individual pens, um, so we can monitor their intake. Uh, and we're feeding them a balanced diet to, to meet protein requirements, so substituting protein back in. Um, they've still got the high ME because of the, they're on a 56% fodder beet diet, which is about the proportion of bulb that they would be eating if they were grazing normally, so up, up to that expected level. And in terms of the substitution question, I don't have the answer yet, but just observations from those ewes. We've got one ewe that's come out of the trial already because she just refused to eat fodder beet. Um, and then eventually went off all feed, quite happy to eat grass, but she won't eat the fodder beet. Um, we've got some ewes that love it, um, and some ewes that don't like it. Um, so some are eating their full allocation and some that don't. There is huge variation between the ewes, nowhere near as much variation on our control lucerne, lucerne diet. So I think there's a palatability thing. We've taken out the, the issue around um, being able to physically harvest the fodder beet by chopping it. Um, so that they can actually just physically eat it. That's, that's taken that out of the equation because I think that could be limiting in the paddock as well. Um, but <coughs> from that study, we should get a bit of an idea of how much substitution is actually going on 
Um, but yeah, you're quite right. It may well be happening out in the paddock. Okay, everyone, we'll have to um, finish it up there. Uh, we've got afternoon tea after this, but uh, I'd just like to thank our speakers very much. And uh, any time you want to be in this part of the world, feel free. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>